Thank you. Questions are powerful. They create connection, they drive destiny, and they inspire action. But the problem is we as humans, our natural instinct is to say something, not ask something. So today I want to explore how questions have started to die in society, why we need to bring them back, and six ways that we can introduce them into our lives. So let's start with some data. In 2013, there was a study out of Britain that found that the average four-year-old asked 390 questions a day. 390. Two things popped through my head. First, kids are jerks. <laughs> and second, those poor mothers, oh my goodness, saved their souls. So 390 questions, that's a lot. And if you do the math, that's a question every two and a half minutes that that kid's awake. So the question here is, what happens to us? Now, it's not realistic for you to ask 390 questions, because if you did, I don't know, you'd have no friends, right? So what is realistic? Let's think back to when we were kids, and we had the courage to ask anyone anything. What happened? Well, as we grew older, fear and insecurity kicked in. We started worrying about what other people thought. Our brains started wandering. Well, what if I ask a question in class and look stupid? What if I say something at a company meeting and look foolish? What if I ask a question that's something that I should know? That's really difficult. When did fear and insecurity replace curiosity? Bruce Lee has a great quote. He says, quote, a wise man can learn more from a foolish question than a fool can from a wise answer. So we need to ask more questions. But besides fear, what else has killed questions in society? Well, social media. What does social media do? It conditions us, it shapes us, it influences us. What happens? We trade statement after statement after statement. We try to one-up each other. Well, I traveled here, I did this, I studied here, I have this house, I'm dating this person. Oh my gosh, it's hard to keep up. And we don't ask questions. Questions are scary. It's vulnerable on social media which is a shame because that's a great way to connect with people. But it may not be the platform for questions. It may not be, and that's okay. But maybe that platform is influencing how we interact in our day-to-day -day lives. I was having a conversation in person which sounded like a social media conversation a little while back. A friend came up to me, just came back from Paris, and said, Steve, I just went to Paris. It was amazing. I went with my family and I loved it. What did I think? Well, my brain goes, well, I just went to Paris. I have to share my thoughts. Let's talk about me, me, me. I went to Paris too. I love the cafes. I love the people watching. Well, me and my family, we got to eat at a restaurant on top of the Eiffel Tower. It was amazing. Well, you know, never going to get what? I got to go to the catacombs and see spots that people have never seen before. It was this competition of statements back and forth, monologues. There was no curiosity. And I thought, did I lose a chance for connection? Was me having these type of conversations impacting my personal relationships? What if I would ask the question? Well, what was your favorite part about going to Paris? What did your family love most? It would have invited them and granted them a chance to speak to me, share more, showed I was interested. I could have built that relationship. So point one, questions create connection. Now, I personally am honored to be here at Bergen Community College, because I am a product of the community college system in California. So California, laid back with my mind on my money, my money on my mind. That is a Snoop Dogg reference for those who love the West Coast. And <laughs> the thing is, the dream in California is to go to UC Berkeley. That is the school, the public school at a community college that is the dream. And so my first day at community college, I go right up, best dressed outfit, I get an appointment for the career counselor. I say, how do I get into UC Berkeley? What do I got to do? And the career counselor responded in a zombie, mono-like tone with RUF. If you're wondering what RUF is, it stands for Resting Unfriendly Face. It has a street name called RBF, but I'm on stage, I can't see the B, okay? So let's keep that between us. <laughs> so, but his answer was, you can try, kid, but nobody gets into those schools. Good luck. And his answer wasn't what mattered. It was the desire behind my question. I wanted to know... How could I go to great schools? How could I achieve more, do more, accomplish more? And I'm proud to say that I did get into UC Berkeley and graduate, and I eventually got into Wharton where I did my MBA. And the question that drives me today is how can I make personal and professional growth fun, real, engaging, life-changing for people? And I started to realize a lot of successful people in life will tend to um, 
do things themselves where they ask questions. So for example, Elon Musk, creator of Tesla, what question does he want to answer? How can we use less fossil fuels in the world? We've got Oprah. She wants to know, how can I help people be their best selves in their lives? We've got Steve Jobs, who was wondering, how can we get a computer in everybody's hand in the world? So what are the questions that you really, really want to answer? What are the questions that will fulfill you, drive you, consume you? What's the question that's going to unlock your destiny? So point number two, questions drive destiny. Now three, when I was at Berkeley, I had a classmate above me called, Jen called her name was Jennifer. <laughs> and Jennifer, as she was graduating, I said, Jennifer, what's your plan after school? It's a basic question. She said, Steve, I'm going to move and live and work in Spain. I said, what? You can do that? That's possible? It blew my mind. Because for me, I grew up in inner city Los Angeles, where just getting out of Los Angeles was a big deal. And I know that there's internet stars who travel, and there's successful people who do all these accomplishments, but me personally, I can't always connect with what they achieve. It seems so big and, and, and large and hard to achieve. But what was great about Jennifer, she was a peer like me. So being able to see that she moved there made it possible for me. And I'm proud to share I did get to live overseas for four years. So thinking about that is totally powerful. And I love meeting people all the time because I love to ask them about their lives, what they're doing. And when they tell me what they're doing, I realize that can be now be possible for me. So number three, questions open the door to possibility. And four, it's not just about asking questions, it's about getting people to ask us questions. And that could be hard. When I first graduated from college, I worked in finance, and I was presenting to clients. And I'd prep my little heart out, get really ready, and then at the end I'd say two words, any questions? <laughs> Crickets. Nobody would say anything. I was like, what am I doing? And I thought about it two things. One, any questions is a statement. And two, it's common autopilot language cliche. Everyone in the corporate world says any questions. It's kind of like when somebody comes up to you and says, how you doing? Your ear tunes out. It's like, we all say that. So we shut down. So I needed to change it from any questions to what questions do you have? What can I explore further? And that's opened up the floodgates. Why is that? Because it perked their ears up. That sounds different. That got my attention. And secondly, it was granting them an invitation by asking a question. So number four, questions grant an invitation. Now five, it can also help you in your personal life. So me, I, I have a fiance, and when she comes home from work, she can either be happy, she can be sad, she can uh, be frustrated with problems and challenges that she deal with. And when she has problems or challenges, me, I want to be Superman. I want to solve those problems for her. I'm like, honey, this is what you should do. And the thing is, I channel my inner vanilla ice. I'm like, babe, if you got a problem, yo, I'll solve it, okay? <laughs> the problem is she doesn't want the answer, okay? She does not like vanilla ice. She's more of a Spice Girls person, right? She's like, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. You might be thinking, where am I going with this? Well, I thought about this, and I have to get from her to tell me what she wants. So the question I asked her is instead of solving a problem with a statement, I said, what would you prefer? Would you prefer me to listen right now, or would you prefer to hear my perspective? And that question changed the game for us. So number five, it builds bridges. And six, it's really important. It's about you as an individual and using questions on yourself. If you're like me, your brain runs. It's like a hamster in a wheel. Oh my gosh, I should do this. My friends are doing this. I got to keep up. I got to work hard. I got to stress. Just the brain keeps running. And statement after statement after statement. And positive statements are better than negative statements, but the best thing our brains can do is be curious and ask questions. So, for example, if I'm prepping for a speech, I could be statements, I'm great, I can do this, really positive, but on the other side, I could ask questions. How can I prep? How can I reduce my nerves? Who can I speak to that could help me? And I want to start answering questions. And questions are more effective, which is proven by social science. In 2010, they had a two groups solve anagrams, so scramble letters to see how many they could get. Group A was all about statements. So they had to write down or think of statements. I can solve anagrams. I am smart. I'm intelligent. Group B asked questions. They'd either write them down or think them. What's the best way to solve these anagrams? How can I, how can I improve my strategy here? So what were the results? Group B, the one that asked questions, solved 50% more anagrams, 50%. Dan Pink writes about this, and why is that the case? 
Because the brain hates an unanswered question. We can't handle it. If I asked you, what's the color of your couch at home? It hijacks your brain. You start thinking about that. So questions put us in a proactive state. We tend to do better. So use questions. But the thing, too, is we have to think about the types of questions that we ask. We can't use whiny questions. Why me? What's wrong? Why does this happen? It's not as effective. Albert Einstein had a great quote. He said, quote, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would spend the first 55 minutes thinking about the right question to ask because I could then answer that question in less than five minutes. So we have to really not just ask more questions, but ask the right questions. And number six, questions inspire us to act, inspire action. So we ask more questions, we ask the right questions, and the final ingredient is how we ask the question. And kids hold that secret. You know why that mom lets that kid come back in the house after 390 questions? Well, one, because it's adorable, right? Well, that's so cute, it's super adorable. But the other reason, that kid is genuinely curious. When they ask, you know, mommy, where do thoughts come from? They actually want to know. And so we have more patience for that. So I encourage you to ask with a spirit of curiosity instead of a spirit of animosity. A spirit of curiosity instead of a spirit of animosity. Because if we think about it, if I'm in an argument with somebody and I say, yeah, well, what would, make, what would change your mind? Huh? What could it do? It's probably not going to work versus I say, what could I say that would change your mind about that candidate? What could I say? And you're sincerely curious. Or yourself. Again, why me? What's wrong? Versus how can I learn from this experience? What can I do better? So in closing, I went to a leadership conference where Billy Bean was speaking. He's the guy from Moneyball, the real guy. And I said, Billy, I coach leaders for a living. What advice should I give him? And he said, Steve, I learned this from a general in the military who said, when times are good, be tough, demanding, and firm on your people. When times are harsh, be patient, kind, and empathetic. But what happens in the real world? The exact opposite. So it made me think about questions. When we need questions the most, whether we're stressed, worried, in an argument, tough day after work, what happens? We go to statements, social media, what we're comfortable with. So wouldn't it be amazing if we could rewire our brains so where our first instinct was to ask a question with a childlike spirit of curiosity? So I want to challenge each and every one of you to unleash that inner child and go out there and ask more questions. Because questions are powerful. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.